having no money, literally, it was a real far financial hardship for me. We thought we were done and over and in the clear, and the nightmare was starting all over again. Hi there, I'm Tom Natchu. Welcome to another episode of Fraud Squad TV. Now, fraud as a crime doesn't sound all that bad, does it? It's not a violent crime like homicide or armed robbery, so why pay any attention to it? It's really just about money. And after all, they say that your health is worth much more than money. The truth is that fraud can devastate people's lives. We're going to show you how ordinary people have lost so much money that they are left destitute, depressed, and in some cases, even suicidal. Imagine your golden years, having worked your whole life assembling a savings, and in the blink of an eye, having it ripped away from you, never to be recovered, and leaving you destitute. At Fraud Squad TV, we've seen these heartbreaking stories time and time again, and we're here because we don't want it to happen to you. Stay tuned for this episode's stories and valuable tips. All of us worry about investing money in a deal gone bad or having someone scam us out of our money. But if someone was going to scam you, when would be the worst possible time for them to do it? Well, how about when you don't even have a job? Employment scams, also known as job scams, happen every day. They involve someone posing as a recruiter or an employer, offering attractive employment opportunities, which most often require money in advance or overpayment using fake checks. Here's a look at two such stories, and later on, we'll tell you how you can safely look for a job online. My mother called me frantic, telling me that the bank is uh, trying to have me arrested if I don't pay them $3,000. He's asked us to protect his identity, and so we'll call him Ivan. Now, Ivan was 22 years old at the time, in college, taking a computer science course. His tuition was quite costly, and he needed a car. So Ivan decided to get a job on the side to help him pay for the schooling and for the transportation. So his first move was to post his resume online. And uh, someone sent me an email through one of those um, employment websites. Hi, I'm Bradley A.B. Clark, an investment broker. I saw your listing on an employment website, and I'd like to offer you a job that allows you to still do other jobs, as it does not require full-time attention. He told me that um, he lived in a different country. I assure you the business is legitimate. I have some stocks in the U.S., but since I do not reside there, I need someone to help me collect my dividends and forward the cash to me. I was uh, promised that if it went well the first time, then it would be a constant, constant transactions. With the promise of making some good money, and with a job that allowed him to focus on his schooling, Ivan decided to accept the position. I received some letters in the mail with money orders from Walmart, uh, four checks for 700. I looked through some fraud websites and I didn't see anything about money orders. There were fake checks and fake uh, traveler's checks, uh, but I didn't see any information about, about um, these kind of things. So I decided I'd go with it. I went to my bank, deposited the money, took it out within the week um, and sent it through Western Union. Well, Ivan was pleased enough with his new position. It allowed him to focus his attention on his schooling and yet promised a good paycheck. Just to simply deposit checks and transfer money, well, what could be simpler than that? But just two weeks later, Ivan's house of cards would fall. I received numerous phone calls, letters in the mail telling me that I would be indicted for grand larceny if I don't pay my bank the money for giving them fraudulent checks. If somebody wants to give you money for any reason and wants you to send money somewhere in return for any reason, it's a scam. Well, my bank has started sending me threatening phone calls about every five minutes um, that if I don't return the money that I withdrew, I will um, be taken to court and imprisoned. I brought them um, 
all the letters, our conversations, every proof that I have about it, and they told me that they don't care. Then I told them that I'm going to get a lawyer, and they said they're a bank and they have thousands of lawyers. Ivan paid the bank the $3,000, and his hopes of making some extra money to help him with the school and to buy a new car turned into a very expensive mistake and debt. The bank wins every time. They have unlimited resources. There's no doubt about that. You could look it up online, read books, they, they never lose. That lesson was also learned by this woman we'll call Mary. She's asked us to protect her identity as well. I was looking for a job, had my resume out on job websites, such as Career Builder. I'd been contacted by a company called Cyberweb Designs out of Madrid, Spain. And this guy said, you know, I saw your resume on the internet and I'm interested in, in talking to you about a position and explained that the company was going to be moving here to the United States and they needed somebody here to be like their payment manager. Mary was sent a contract in the mail, so she took the contract to a lawyer that she knew just to make sure that the job was legitimate. And obviously the wording wasn't Americanized, but it looked very legitimate, it looked real, so they said, yeah, go ahead and give it a try. So I signed the contract, sent it back to him, and he said, okay, well, then our customers are gonna be sending you checks, and what you're gonna do is deposit it, and we'll tell you how much you need to send back to us, and you keep the rest. They're hired as an accountant, uh, bookkeeper, and if you would just handle the deposit of these checks. The first check I got was for like $2,400. Forward us the remaining, and of course the checks are bad, and, and the victim's on the hook for it. And I deposited it. So the next day, I withdrew out approximately $1,400 to send back to the company in Spain, only a week later to find out that the check had been, they'd had a stop payment on that specific check. Well, employment scams can cost you a lot more than the time you lost trying to find a job. They can end up costing you big bucks. Now, that's money that if you're looking for a job, you may not even have. Being unemployed and having no money, literally, it was a real far financial hardship for me. It is bother bothersome that the victims who are really trying to make a difference, they're trying to, they're, they're just trying to get by however they can, sure, that pulls at your heartstrings. And having no recourse, the only thing I could do is try to, you know, find another job as quickly as, as possible and then pay the bank back. We're here once again with Craig Hannaford, our resident expert on fraud. Ivan is a kid. You can almost see how he would fall for that. I mean, that kind of a job where you just cash checks for somebody else seems too good to be true. Well, and it was too good to be true, and that's what people got to realize. If you've been given a job and essentially you're not doing any work, you got to figure out that it's a scam. True enough. Now, Mary did do due diligence. She went to her lawyer. She checked it all over. And, you know, a foreign company who needs help with the payroll, that seems more legit. Well, you've got to really wonder, like, if, it's, if a company is legitimate and uh, they're having problems doing their banking and they need you to cash a check for them and send you back money, that really doesn't pass a smell test and you got to take a step back. True enough. So if you're looking for a job, I bet you could use a few more tips. And Craig's got them for you right now. Anytime someone wants you to deposit a foreign check in your account and send them back some of the money, watch out. It's probably a scam. Remember, foreign checks can take over a month to absolutely clear. Just because your bank lets you use some of those funds in a week or so, it does not mean the check is clear. Beware of third-party checks. If you don't know the check writer, beware. Stand by. We'll be right back with more Fraud Squad TV. For many of us, adoption is a choice taken when a couple wants to start a family. Sometimes they just can't conceive naturally, and other times they only want to bring an available child into their family. Now, adoption fraud preys on these emotions by taking people's money without ever delivering a child for adoption. In this story, we'll see how one group of fraudsters crushed the dreams of a couple looking to adopt. Counting what we spent for the fraudulent adoption for the illegal adoption, and then what we spent to make everything legal in the neighborhood of $40,000.
High school science teacher David Kruchko and his wife wanted to start a new family. Now, they felt that there is already enough children in the world, so they decided to adopt. Some friends of theirs suggested two women from Long Island with an agency called Adoptive Choice. We had requested a toddler age girl. We were offered a referral of a child, and they give you a picture and with a very sketchy background on the child. And the first child, we were told that her um, parents were in jail in Mexico, and she was living with her maternal grandmother with her older sister, and the maternal grandmother did not have the means to support both children, so she would like to see the younger one placed, and then if if that things worked out, she might later on decide to place the older one. So we accepted that referral. Later on, we were told the grandmother changed her mind. A short time after that, a second referral was made by the agency. This child was, the story we got was that the child was the child of a impoverished mother in Mexico who had more children than she could afford to support, and that she had already placed one child, and we accepted that referral and for whatever reason, things kept dragging on and dragging on. And when we started to question things, we started getting some negative feedback from the agency. And then we were told that that referral fell through. For the first two referrals, it didn't happen. The money that we had spent, the fees that we had paid, were carried over. I think we had an agency fee of about $4,000. The attorney's fee was $16,000. We paid half of it upon acceptance of the referral, and the other half was supposed to be on receiving the child. David was beginning to give up. He suggested cutting his losses and quitting, but his wife asked to give the agency just one more chance. Uh, we were offered either a partial refund or a second or another referral. I said, let's take the second referral and I, the next, third referral, and I said, let's, I said, that's fine, but I want to see this child for real. I want to make sure that we're not just getting pictures of any child off the street somewhere in Mexico. As time dragged on, we were asked for additional money for foster care, which, and according to the agency contract, was never outlined or never presented to us as a separate charge. So I objected to that, and that's when the agency started getting a little bit nasty with us, telling us things like, don't you want your daughter to be properly fed and clothed? David and his wife met with an official of the agency in Mexico who provided a lovely little girl for them to adopt, but didn't seem to have the necessary paperwork. Well, eventually, they were given more paperwork and went ahead with the adoption, but when they tried to come home, they realized the paperwork was incomplete. So they decided to voice their concerns with the New York State Attorney General's office and it came to light that we weren't the only ones with concerns about the people we were using in the Mexican adoptions. And we met another family who happened to have our second referral. And while the agency kept charging the Kretschkas for each bogus referral, they also manipulated the couple to keep them on the hook. We were being subjected to financial and emotional coercion, and that's not an uncommon thing, as I've learned in the subsequent years, with the way the adoption industry operates and the way a lot of adoption agencies operate. Uh, you have to check out the company. You have to find a track record. You have to find people um, who have adopted successfully and, and talk to them. But sometimes that's not enough, too. They have the carrot hanging over your head or the light at the end of the tunnel. And, well, it's going to take this much more if you want that. And lately, in recent in recent years, I've been reading things from victims of other adoption frauds, where now, if you start to complain or speak out against things you don't think are going right or are working right or are not the way they're supposed to be, the agency turns around and says, well, then there's something wrong with you, and maybe we'll hold off on completing this adoption until you complete agency-mandated psychological counseling. And while the entire ordeal cost the Kretzkows $40,000, the real suffering came from the uncertainty of being able to be sure they were going to keep the daughter they were caring for. When we moved from New York to Florida, where we are now, we decided that having a U.S. passport was a good proof of citizenship, but the ultimate proof of citizenship was getting a certificate of citizenship. So we applied to the CIS office in Miami, Florida for a certificate of citizenship. 
And when they looked at the case, they weren't happy with the way New York had handled things. And they decided that maybe this child should be deported. And they began the process, the initial process of deportation proceedings. And basically, we thought we were done and over and in the clear, and the nightmare was starting all over again. But fortunately, and this one only took two years, uh, fortunately things worked out for the best and everybody got on the same page and our daughter did get her certificates of citizenship. Preying on the emotional vulnerabilities of adoptive couples is what adoption fraudsters count on to keep getting your money. You have to really reach out to, uh, if, it, if it's a foreign adoption agency, reach out to the State Department, reach out to that country, ask them about the legitimacy of that adop adoption uh, company. Adoption fraud doesn't just victimize the adoptive parents, it victimizes the children in that way. And in a lot of, in a lot of cases, especially when it comes to international adoptions and adopting from underdeveloped impoverished countries, it victimizes the birth families too. You're just asking for, as I said, more heartbreak and, and I don't think that's what these people are looking for. I don't want to scare people away from adoption but I want them to be careful out there. I want them to go in with their eyes wide open. The saddest thing is the identity issue, the fact that her identity was a fabrication and we have no lead to the truth at all. And you know, there are medical issues that it would be nice to know some genetic and biological background. There are other issues that it would be nice to know. And, and for her own sake, the identity is an issue. It's not like she was a foundling. Somebody placed her with Reyes so there is somebody who she is the daughter of that is known to someone somewhere, and it would be nice to have that information for her if and when she would want it. Now comes a time that I like, especially where I get to ask Craig some questions about this. You know, this has got to be the cruelest type of fraud ever. I mean, these people, six years, all of that money. Uh, you're, you're, you're anxious, you want to get the adoption over with, so you're paying money. At what point do you quit paying money? Well, if you're not getting any results from adoption agency, you really got to stop and take a look and maybe switch agencies. But one of the things people can do is check whether the adoption agency is properly registered with the state authority. Well, are there such organizations that registers them with state authorities? Well, it, it would depend from state to state, but yes, generally they would have to be licensed. So that's one place that you can check to see whether it's actually a legitimate adoption agency. All right, so if I'm looking out for a, an adoption, if we're thinking about it, where are the kind of places that I should look? Well, you should start with your state regulating agency. You may want to look on the internet to get uh, referrals and uh, references uh, from friends or other people who have adopted. That's a great way to get a reference. If you know somebody who's had a successful adoption, take their recommendation. See with your own eyeballs, then you trust it. I bet you're wondering more about this. Craig's got some more tips right now. Be wary of an adoption agency that states they have had a 100% or near perfect success rate. Do not accept guarantees that an agency will find a child for you within a definite period of time. Don't use an adoption agency that requests a large upfront fee with the rest due upon the completion of the adoption. Get and investigate a number of references from previous satisfied clients. Stand by, we'll be right back with more Fraud Squad TV. Hi, I'm Naomi Joy. Now we've said a lot about protecting your personal information, but there is no end to how diligent you need to be. More than 50% of identity theft victims were also the victims of credit card fraud. It's not only the financial loss for these victims, but North Americans will spend more than 300 million hours this year resolving issues relating to identity theft. Not only do you have to be careful who you give your personal information to, you also have to protect information that is being sent to you. So get a locking mailbox, make sure you receive new credit cards and checks, and if you don't receive them, follow up with your financial institution right away. Call the post office if you haven't received mail for an unusual amount of time as well. And remember, companies don't forget to send out their bills. If you don't receive one, call the company. It may be a sign your mail has been redirected. Now, Fraud Squad TV takes it to the street to hear more ways fraudsters have tried to get your money.
My grandfather actually had it happen to him five times with the same credit card. He was in um, at his house and he got a phone call from Visa saying that he had his charge card charged in Italy for something like seven thousand dollars and it obviously wasn't him because he was at home. He never ended up getting charged for it but he would always have to kind of go through a lot of crap to try to explain to them that it wasn't him because he did travel a lot so it was kind of an inconvenience for him because he had to explain himself even though it wasn't him. I would just say always be careful keep all your receipts for where you go so if you ever have to prove it then you have backup. Um, usually you have patterns for for money so when something comes up out of nowhere you're going to kind of realize that's not you and just be very careful well somebody got my uh pin number and uh somehow you know my card information and deposited a fake check in my account and was able to withdraw money from my account and uh my bank caught it and they saw that it was an unusual amount and so on and so they just uh, gave me credit for the uh, withdrawal and they issued me a new card so the bank was pretty cool about it, yeah. Thank you for sharing your stories. By telling your stories, we just might prevent someone else from falling for the same scam. If you want to learn more about protecting yourself from fraud, or if you have a story to share, visit our website at fraudsquadtv.com. Let's fight fraud together. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of Fraud Squad TV. You know, at fraudsquadtv.com, you'll find a host of information, some of it entertaining and some of it very useful so that these types of frauds don't happen to you. Remember, we're all in this fighting fraud together.